uh, we are on. So it's a great pleasure uh, to have Dr. Martin Zayek on our program. He was uh, born and raised in Miami Beach, Florida, and he obtained his bachelor's degree in science at the University uh, of uh, Miami. Following his undergraduate studies, he attended the medical school of Wisconsin School of Medicine. His ventures led him back to his roots in Miami, where he became the program director of the Department of Dermatology at Mount Sinai Medical Center. And now he's the director and co-founder of the Greater Miami Skin and Laser Center. Uh, Dr. Zayek is a professor and chairman of dermatology at Herbert Wartham College of Medicine at Florida International University. As chief, he's actively involved in clinical practice, research, and teaching. And he's very active in international matters. And with all that, he's going to uh, share his wisdom on uh, surgical uh, issues and aesthetic uh, uh, purse. And with that, thank you so much for coming on this program. And uh, please start your lecture. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Thank you, Laz, for a great and overrated uh, introduction. But anyways, so this lecture I kind of put together, it's more or less my experience over the years, more than I want to admit, but each one of them could be an individual lecture, so certainly, hopefully we'll all be working together in the near future and we'll go over them in more detail. But basically these are my pearls. And we're going to talk about some surgical pearls, like in wound closing, the way I like to do dermal nevus shaving. The dermatopathologist may not like it, but you know that's the way we want to do it. So cosmetically, it's better for the patient. Something to do with punch biopsies and also cystic scissions. So the more important thing in surgical material is that it's made with a certain braid or it's made with a certain coating on the outside in order to prevent it from becoming little foci where bacteria and other types of germs that we wouldn't want to get into the wound cannot stick. So you never want to touch your surgical suture with your instrument in this manner. If you want to do it, you want to slide it. If you want to like pull it out, instead of grabbing it with the forceps or with the needle holder, you want to put it on the smooth surface like you see here and kind of slide it out. You never want to try to pinch it. So again, here you wouldn't want to pinch it. You'd want to try to slide it. Well, we lost that one, but let's see. We want to slide it around the smooth edge. Never want to try to pinch it, okay? So here's a pulley stitch, which I find super advantageous when you have a big wound that's under a lot of tension. Those of you who have worked with me know that I don't particularly like to undermine, because again, undermining, unless you really have to, is another way that you're introducing an infection. So the pulley stitch really takes the tension off the wound, most of us who do surgery, we try to put a vicro stitch across this big area. As we're pulling it tight, 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 many times it'll break. So not only is it frustrating that it breaks and blood splatters all over the place, but it's a waste of time. And unfortunately with medicine, we don't have an art of medicine anymore. It's trying to be the most efficient and cost effective. So in order to avoid having those vicro stitches breaking, we do this pulley stitch, which basically is a stitch that you'll see, hopefully. Does it not pick up like, oh, there it goes. Does that, yeah. So we put it in on one side, and we kind of pull it through the deep. You want to go relatively deep. And then you want to put it through the sub-Q and out the epidermis on this side. Like a vertical mattress, you turn the needle around and go back in on the same side. But here, you go back over across on the opposite side. You do just basically repeat the same stitch. And you go across, and you see carefully I'm trying to avoid touching the suture material with my instruments. And once you have it like this, you go ahead and tie it. You can do three, three throws, and when you tie it three throws, you can pull it across and lock it. Many times, although I have 15 employees, I'm working by myself, so it's a good way that you can lock the stitch in place, and you don't have to worry about it popping open. So once you have that pulley stitch in place, you can see there's no more tension on the wound, and you can put in your vicral stitches. I used to leave the pulley stitch in, but here you see I'm putting a vicral stitch on each side, and then when I'm done doing these vicral stitches, I'll cut out the pulley stitch in the middle, and then put another vicral stitch or subcutaneous stitch in, in the middle, because I've learned over the years that, not in excess, but if you put at least three, depending on the size of the lesion, 
subcutaneous stitches in, the wound healing is much better. I mean, there's no question on areas of tension, if you only put one sub-Q in or none, eventually that tissue is going to spread open and it's going to increase the scar size. So that essentially, this rest of this video kind of shows the same thing over and over again. So we're going to go ahead and skip. The next thing I like to do, and those of you who work with me, you know that I'm very keen on eversion. In order for a wound to heal well, each side of the wound has to be level. If you sew it and they're unlevel or there's like a drop off, when it heals, it's going to heal with a drop off. So eversion is key. And one of the ways to create eversion is when you're putting your needle in the skin, you want to go in perpendicular. Like you see here, you're going to go in perpendicular. And when you go to the other side of the tissue, I'm going to stop it for a second. Well, I guess I missed it. But when you go into the other side, when you get into the deep dermis, Let's see when I do the next stitch, I'll try to stop it. I lost my arrow. When you go into the other side, you want to stop. Oh God. You want to try to stop the stitch and grab the chunk of the dermis and you pull it towards you pull it towards yourself. So you're pulling that, you're bunching up the dermis and pulling it towards the wound, and what it does, it kind of raises that and causes more eversion. Let's see if everyone can pay attention to it. They'll catch it. There I'm not really doing because I'm just doing my tie-off. But you'll see on the next throw, I'll go through the epidermis on the right side. But when I come out with the needle on the left side, I'm grabbing the dermis and I'm pulling the needle back towards the center of the wound to kind of force it. You see there, forcing it in. And that raises that edge and causes that fine eversion. So I call that the claw because it's kind of like a claw grabbing on the tissue and pulling it back. But really... When you're doing it, you should do it in combination to get the full amount of eversion with what we call the Z-stitch. And you can see here, this is a horizontal running mattress. And what happens sometimes is this tissue grows over and these little pieces are very hard to find. So you're ending up digging in and creating a lot of you know, injury and discomfort to the patient. So about two years ago, we wrote an article called the Z-stitch for Zorro or I guess some people would say for Zyac, where after doing a couple throws of the horizontal running, we take one throw across the middle. So therefore you're creating a bridge across the wound. So when the patient comes back in two weeks to get the stitches out, you can see here that you can see where these horizontal runnings, everyone sees the arrow pointing. They could be deep and underneath the skin where always you can cut the knot and then you can cut this one bridge and then you can pull it through. I think this saves a lot of time. I think that you can see here that the wound is becoming very everted, which I very much like, because even if it's over everted, and some of the patients will say, well, wow, it's really sticking out. Is that going to be fine? Once you take the stitches out and the skin starts to stretch back into its position, it lays flat, where if you leave it just flat and it starts to stretch or contract, you're going to get a stretch, stretching scar. The other thing I like about the horizontal running is that in this area here, the most common area where we get bleeding that's a nuisance in, in surgery is from the dermal epidermal you know, border, not so much deep vessels. Big vessels we can see and we stop the bleeding, but this dermal bleeding is a pain. So when you do this horizontal running, it creates pressure against the dermis and it stops the little epidermal bleeding. So you see here, I left that pulley stitch in that I had done initially. I put in my vertical uh, subcutaneous tissue and now at the end of the surgery here I'll remove this pulley stitch. But you can see every two or three throws I'll throw over one of these cross bridges and it kind of forms like a Z and that's why we call it the Z stitch. So dermal nevi obviously when you think that you have a melanocytic nevus or something that could be potentially malignant you want to take a punch biopsy or an excisional biopsy but if you know it's a dermal nevus and the patients are really just taking it off because it bothers them and really more for cosmetic reasons. The worst thing you want to do is create a cosmetic defect that's worse than the actual than the actual mole. And most people, I think, would probably try to inject underneath the mole because they think they want to get anesthesia underneath the mole. So what happens when you do that is you create a double lift. So you have the wheel of the anesthesia and then you have the wheel of or the lesion of the nevus. And when you go to shave it, what happens a lot of times, and this is an exaggeration, is you get a divot. So obviously if you're taking off a dermal nevus that you know is benign just for cosmetic reasons, you definitely don't want to create a, a divot. So what I do is I inject directly into the nevus 
and blow the nevus up. Most of them are a little bit soft and mushy, and uh, it blows up like a balloon. And once you do that, this definition of the nevus against the epidermis is a very clean cut plane. And you just take your blade, obviously not a shaving blade, but your 15 blade, and you want to lay it flat. I, you'll see when you come and work in my office with me, I lay the blade flat on the patient's skin, and I basically shave right across the base, and I create a flat removal of this dermal nevus without creating a divot. If anybody has a question, obviously either you know come in or, or speak to chat with Laz. But you can see here that in here we remove the top, but we have not created a divot. So it's very important when you're doing cosmetic stuff to always think about the end result. You don't want to create a divot here. You want to have a nice smooth appearance of the defect. <coughs> so here's an example live basically where you inject directly into the nevus and you just slowly inject and you can see it blows up very tense and once you see this blanching you know the anesthesia is getting in there and all of a sudden you'll see like a little rim of blanching right at the base when you see that rim of blanching at the base you know we're ready to go you take your blade you lay it flat onto the skin and you can either do it all from one side or sometimes I'll go across and I'll switch the other side but if it's nice and tense and you're laying it flat on the skin Every time it comes out very smooth and flat without a divot. And that's the concept, not to create a divot. So when we're doing punch biopsies, it's very frustrating sometimes that the, the material gets stuck into the biopsy. And if you take up forceps and try to pull it out, the pathologists don't like it. So most of the punch biopsies are hollow. So if you take a long paper clip and you push it through the back end, what happens is it pushes it out and you don't destroy the tissue which is a little pearl which the dermatopathologists appreciate because they don't like that pinch or crush artifact. Here's a cyst. This was a smaller one. I think we have a couple of them here. But basically, if the cyst is at this size, uh, most surgeons or non-dermatologic surgeons would create their ellipse and try to cut out this giant ellipse. And I think with all these cystic lesions, they have a capsule which is uh, which is usually, unless it's been manipulated by being squeezed, pretty simple to get out. So what I do, rather than try to cut a big ellipse, is I make an incision right down the middle. And by doing that, I believe that these capsules are pushed in against the skin because of the pressure of all this material that's in the inside. So once you get that stuff out, you can grab the capsule and pull it out, and it comes out entirely through a tiny little slit. And you could save a patient a large scar when you know it's something that's not benign. Now some people ask me, well, you can't bill it the same because you're not billing such a large defect, but I'd rather do something that's going to be better for my patient than bill it. If it's somebody who's been picking and squeezing at their cyst, there may be a lot of fibrosis, so that may not work as easy, but I always try this first, and then if I can't get the capsule out through this simple procedure, then I'll go ahead and expand my ellipse to the size needed. This is just another example of more or less the same thing. Trying to advance a little bit more. Again, this would be the cyst or whatever. We didn't know what it was. It ended up being a pilometrixoma. Just trying to advance. Just inject a little bit of anesthesia. Rather than cut this big elliptical triangle that a lot of surgeons would go out and do right away, we put our anesthesia in. And we make our little incision straight down the middle. If it's a cyst that you have a, a visible dilated pore, you would want to cut right in through there. Obviously, the only disadvantage of this is that if you do have a little bit of bleeding, you hard to find the bleeders. But you can see here, I pinch the tissue. I put pressure on it to try to force it up. With the tweezers, I try to get the material out. And you can see this is a little bit, you know, coagulated blood, but it ended up being like a pilometric zone. And you'll see the amount of tissue that comes out through that little hole without having to create a big defect for the patients. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer, but I think at the end we're trying to do what's best for the patient and not so much uh, the time. Here I just use scissors to loosen it up a little bit. And hopefully now we're going to deliver this baby. You can see this hard calcification pop out through this little hole. And sometimes I don't even put a little stitch. I'll just leave it here like that, or I'll put one simple stitch in. But I think the patients are happier. 
a lot of times what I do is I'll take an applicator, like a dry cotton applicator like you just saw, and I'll stick it in the hole, and whatever little cyst material that may be loose in there or whatever is there will stick to the dry applicator, and then it will uh, come out a lot easier. So I guess the other cyst is not there, but more or less the same thing. So now we'll talk about some cosmetic pearls. Am I going too fast or this is okay? Okay, I guess it's okay. It is okay. I mean, it, it is great. Uh, the videos are great. I just muted myself so not to trouble. Oh, okay, that perfect. Is great. Thank you. So obviously before any cosmetic procedure, you have to evaluate the patient. You have to have them sign an informed consent and you have to photograph. By far, more people that are not particularly satisfied with themselves will come back after you do something like Botox or filler or laser and they'll say, oh doctor, I spent X amount of thousands of dollars. I wish it was thousands of dollars, but whatever it is, I spent X amount of money and I don't see a difference. If you don't have a picture to show the before, you're kind of stuck because you can't really prove to them. But when they see the before picture and they see the after picture, you always have, you know, your your credibility behind you. So these three things are critical. And the patient evaluation includes do they have realistic expectations? If they come in with a picture with Angelina Jolie and say they want to look like Angelina Jolie, it's not going to happen, or whoever your famous, you know, actor person is. But you have what your basic architecture is. You're born with it. It changes with time. I think Dr. Shino Bay has talked about it. If not, we can talk about it in another lecture. You know, we lose fat in certain areas, and it redistributes other areas. And the whole goal of cosmetic rejuvenation is to restructure or re, you know, recreate the movement of tissue, which is going up rather than going down. It's like a scaffolding. And really, the combination of a lot of things really helps. So obviously, you take into consideration the skin type. Someone who's 80 years old or who's got so much redundant skin is probably not the best candidate. But the most important thing is expectations. Again, if this patient thinks that they're going to end up looking like, you know, whoever, Angelina Jolie is the only one I can think of that comes to my mind, but or Nicole Kidman or Selma Halleck, then it's, it's not going to happen. So you have to try to make sure that they're capable of understanding what we can do and never overpromise. Better to underpromise and show that you can do much better so that they're super happy. So again, if the patient wants to have skin like Selma Halleck or eyes like Nicole Kidman or lips like Julia Roberts and you try to put them all together, it creates a monster. So it doesn't exist, okay? So just keep that in mind, patient expectations, informed consent is important, obviously, and you always have to take a picture beforehand. And one of the things that you have to point out is that everybody is asymmetric to some degree to another. 80% of the population has one eyebrow that's higher than the other. And if you don't point it out beforehand, they're going to say, well, you did Botox, and now this eyebrow is higher or this one is lower. So that's why a before picture is better. Lips, if you look at them, very rarely are they symmetric. There's always one side that's a little bit fuller, one side that's a little bit longer. The, the angle of the way it kind of curves, it changes. You need to point that out because otherwise they're going to blame you for changing the way they look. Most people don't realize they look at themselves in the mirror all the time, and they're used to what they see. Once they see something different, if they like it, it's great. If they don't like it, then it's going to be an issue. One of the things that is also, you know, people get nervous about is when you're injecting lips, <clears throat> they're used to what their lips look like. No matter if you put the smallest amount of filler in the lips or more in the lips, it's going to be different. You have to tell them it's going to look different. It's going to be bigger. Even though I put a tiny little bit because I believe less is better, they still think they look huge because they're used to what they have had. Someone who's got nice lips and just wants a little bit more, maybe not as much as someone who's a little bit older and their lips have totally deflated, they're going to flip out a little bit, but you just reassure them that it's going to be fine. So asymmetry and talking about it beforehand, making sure you take a picture of it to show them is critical. And again, another example, asymmetry at rest and asymmetry in action. Much more asymmetrical, but you have to point that out. Preparation, I think, is important. Application, knowing the muscles. It's a tug of war. You have muscles that pull up and you have muscles that pull down. So if you want to lift something up, what do you have to do? You have to take away the downward pull. If you want to pull something down, you have to take away the upward pull. If you want to understand the movements. When you're talking to the patient, look at them. How do they express? Are they lifting one eyebrow more? Are they squinting more with one side? Are they smiling more? These are all things that you have to observe because and point it out because they will come to you later and say, oh, look what happened. Look at this. They may not even notice it. Okay, so talking about preparation, obviously in the United States we have Dysport, 
Botox, Allergan, and Zeoman. The myoblock was a was a type two or a B type uh, toxin, and it had a lot of promise, but it was way too expensive. The differences here are very little. If you adjust your dilution and you put the clinical amount so that they're all equivalent, you can get the same clinical result. Dysport will stay last longer than Botox. Botox will stay last longer than Dysport. Zeoman is not a lot of experience, but clinically you can get the same end result if you use the same number of equivalent units. I personally, you know, I'm pretty loyal to to what I do in my life, and Botox has always been good. Patients that are happy, why would I want to switch them to another product to save fifty dollars? I don't see it. If someone comes in and say they want to try the Dysport, they want to try the Zeoman. I have it available. It really, the clinical result, which is really what most patients are interested in, can be equivalent in all of them. I think that you know they used to sell Dysport in 500 unit vials after changes. Now the one that we get here is 300 units. So typically, it used to be double the amount of Dysport for the equivalent of Botox, but because it's a 300 unit vial, you basically have to put three times the amount. So three units of Dysport are equivalent to one unit of Botox in my mind, and Zeoman is basically one to one with Botox. So in order to do this the best, I think that you should dilute with the least. It's not the volume of solution you put into the patient's skin, it's the number of units. So people come and tell me, oh, I got a 1 cc of Botox and it was only $100. Well, 1 cc the way I do is 100 units. That would be a lot of money. So it has to be diluted. So how do you dilute it? The FDA says 2.5 milliliters per 100 units. And why they chose that number, that was just a random number and it worked. Then Arnie Klein, who just passed away, who's probably one of the smartest dermatologists I ever knew, he was a biochemist and understood everything about the mechanisms of all medicines. He said, well, if we do 2.5 and we are diluting with this 21 gauge needle in this hub here, you're going to lose about 0.2 cc's. So I'm going to start doing it with 2.7 because I want to get an exact dilution in the vial. Then the Corollas decided that they thought too much dilution <clears throat> meant too much solution and it may diffuse to areas that we don't want it to do. So they said, I'm going to dilute with 1 cc or, or you know, 100 uh, one uh, milliliter per 100 units with the same concept if you're going to lose 0.2 cc's in this little green hub I'm going to put in 1.2 so what I do now is I dilute with 1.2 and in order to be able to see accurately the number of units because 1.1 cc dilution is a 0 0.01 milliliters is one unit and there's no way in a regular 1 cc syringe that you can see that. That would be 10 units right in here. So if you wanted to use one unit, it would be very difficult to see. So they started using these 0.3 cc syringes so that each line is 0 0.01 or one unit. So here, if you want to put 10 units, you just draw up to 10 and you know it's perfect. If I'm using this port and I use my dilution of 3 to 1, I, I use the equivalent units the same. So I'm doing 10 units of this port which is really 30 units of this port, but I, I try to make my dilution so I'm, when I'm injecting, it's always the same. These syringes are excellent because there's no hub, so the, the stopper or the plunger goes right to the back of the, the needle, which goes all the way up to here, so you're not wasting any. If you're using a 1cc syringe, every time you put one of these hubs on, you're losing 0 0.1, 0 0.2, possibly cc's of solution, and that could be two units. If you're doing 10 patients a day, that's 200 units, or 20 units, it's wasting money in the garbage. So we use these 0.3 cc syringes, and they have a, they're for diabetics, so they're ultra fine, like 31 gauge. But if you stick that needle through this rubber stopper, it's going to dull right away. So what I do is I buy one of these decappers, I take the cap off, and I draw my solution directly out. You just have to be careful because if you dilute this and you knock it over and it spills on the table, you're not going to be happy. The other thing I do, which is, this is a long video, but I'm going to shorten it out. Obviously, I use this vial in the morning. You have to always tell your patients that the Botox comes as a fine powder. It's just this little rim of white that you see around the base here because they say, oh, you're diluting it. You're ripping me off. Why are you diluting it? Well, you have to dilute it because it comes as a powder. The amount of dilution is two different things. So in the morning, I've used this vial, and there's a tiny bit left. So what I do, because I know that it's so concentrated that along the inside of that vial, any little bit of liquid is one unit. So you draw up your, your solution and 1.2 cc's, and then you mix it into the other, to the other uh, 
into the vial that I had finished this morning, and I kind of like wash the sides of the vial. As long as you're using the same concentration of solution, I think it just super concentrates, and you're not wasting. You're getting every little drop out of those vials. At $600 a vial, you don't want to waste a drop because every one unit is six bucks. So you draw that out and then you put it into the new vial, and as long as you maintain the same dilution, then there's no problem. So I think it may be more psychological than anything else, but I think I'm probably saving two to three to four units on every vial that I do that with. Obviously, there's a lot of variations in contraction, so you can't really do the same thing for everybody. You have people with very deep, more parallel type things. You have ones that are more angled. You have other ones that have total different variations, like this corrugator creates these lines here. So you can't just do everybody like textbook. The key to doing it is to doing it, you know, effectively. And the way I do it, I always start in this glabellar position here first because it's the most, you know, people are nervous if they've never had it done. You want to see the movements, and I pinch this area, the glabellar area, and I go ahead and stick the needle in, and I hold it there. Once you have the needle through the skin, it doesn't hurt at all. And you can stay there all day long, it doesn't hurt. What hurts is the needle touching the skin and passing through the epidermis. So you want to get into your right position, and you want to pop right through the skin. I also have the patients contract when I'm feeling. I always keep my thumb on the orbital rim. Here you can't see it, but you'll see on the other one. But I always keep my thumb on the orbital rim because you don't want to get underneath the orbital rim because if you get underneath the orbital rim, you may get the levator muscle, and that's where you get lid ptosis. So I also have them contract. When I have the needle in the skin, I have them contract, because I want to feel that muscle pushing up against the, the needle. On the other side, I just keep my hand, I use my index finger, I have them contract, contract when I have the needle in, and you can see the needle moves. I put in my dose, contract again, because you want to see where the angle is. If they contract all the way back to here, you may have to put one extra unit all the way here. A lot of times after you do Botox, oh, hold on a second. A lot of times after you do Botox, the patient will come back to the office. Let me see if I can do. Try to find the right. The patient will come back to the office, and they'll. The patient will come back to the office, and they'll say, "Oh, look! You see, I still have some movement here." If you look at them, this part of the corrugator, which we injected two weeks ago, is not moving, but you'll see some movement over here. So what happens is the brain tries to recruit every last little bit of muscle. And so if you see this angle forming over here, you know that you probably have to do one unit back in here to create that. Because this little bit of pushing here forces the skin in and creates a little bit of motion. So always keep that in mind. Variation in the crow's feet contraction. Obviously, this is a simple case. You can put over here in the lateral and up here on the tail to create that. This one you could probably get away with putting a little bit down here, and it'll help with these lines. But this lady here... Most of these lines that are on this cheek are caused because when she smiles, all this cheek comes up on the zygomatic arch here, and this, and this uh, muscle pushes up and forces these lines up. So no matter what you do with Botox, unless you want to put so much in here that it looks like she has a stroke, you're not going to get rid of these lines. So I usually tell patients like this, you can put a little bit here to soften it, but this is where we're going to work mostly in the lateral portion and the superior portion of the orbicularis to... Uh, to, uh, to lift this and then maybe convince them that putting some filler over here to increase the volume will stretch those lines out and improve it. But you always have to look at the patient and explain to them that you're not going to be able to do it. Here I try to put on a younger patient, you can put a little bit right underneath the eyelid. Sometimes we do that there if the eyes are asymmetrical, one is smaller and you want to get it larger. But if they have this little crepiness underneath, you can get away with putting one unit right under here, mid pupil, this typical spot here, and here you can see nice results. This is just showing the injections in this area. I don't know if we want to go to all these videos, but uh, you want to feel the orbital rim, you want to be a centimeter away. One important point is that it doesn't matter where you put the needle in. If you have a spinal needle, you can start all the way down here. It's where the tip of the needle ends up because that's where the units are going to go in. So if you have a lot of veins and stuff, you don't, obviously you don't want to hit the veins. You can start all the way back here and advance your needle up underneath to get in the right position. So it doesn't matter where the needle goes in. You want that tip of the needle to be in the proper position to affect the muscles you're going after. So here we're going to the lateral orbicularis oculi muscle. Here we're going to the superior lateral, which pushes down this way. And if you take this away, if you take that motion away, pulling down this way, and you leave the frontalis muscle here pulling up, what's going to happen? It's going to lift the lid. So if you want to get the maximum eyebrow and lid lift, 
you want to inject the depressors of the brow, which are these lateral orbicularis muscle here, and the corrugators and the glabellar muscle, which are the depressors centrally, and you let the frontalis go full strength and you're going to lift it up. <clears throat> Anyone that's over 40 or 50 years old, you want to be very, very careful over treating the forehead. The frontalis muscle, over treating the frontalis muscle, and the lineup for the tail of the the tail of the of the brow in order to get it to lift, you take the ailer groove here and you go to the lateral canvas and you put a line up. So you want your injection to be lateral here. You never want to base your injection on where the eyebrow is because you know how some men and some women are, they pluck their eyebrows, they reshape the eyebrows. So you always want to feel the bony structures and line up your, your landmarks to get the proper injection. Some people may, you know, manicure their eyebrows so it comes all the way out to here. If you inject over here, you're getting more frontalis, you're going to get a brow drop. So always line up and feel the bone. You want to go by the bone, not on the brow position. So what I was saying is that most people that have trouble nowadays, the lid ptosis was mostly because of poor technique and not knowing about the orbital rim. But most of the problem people have now is what we call brow ptosis, where you over-treat. And there I was just showing you about these lines over here that sometimes you can't get rid of them all. And if you put too much Botox here, you're going to get this depression of this whole cheek and it's going to look like you have a, a stroke. But the biggest problem we have now is over-treating the frontalis. Here I'm showing that leaving the lateral frontalis muscle intact, you get this lift. You want to work on the central frontalis in order to, to reduce some of the horizontal lines, but you want to not over-treat it because otherwise the entire forehead is going to drop down. The frontalis you want to pick is your middle canthus, and your lateral limbus, and we'll see that in a second. Again, variations and contractions. Most people have two individual bands of muscle that come from the, the upper edge of the brow, orbital rim, up to the scalp, and they go all the way up. And you can see here that the lines reflect that. You have a horizontal line, then you have a depression. Why? Because there's no muscle here. So why would you put Botox here? You're just wasting units. If you're going to charge the patient for it, it's fine, but if you're saying it's $300 for this area, you really only need to inject here and here and over here and nothing in the middle. So depending on how the lines are, you have to adjust. You can see here that on this area here, he's got one, two, three, four lines. Over here, it's just one, two, three. So he's got stronger or more pull here. And you can see that the eyebrow even raises higher. So here, if you wanted to get a symmetrical look, you'd want to put a couple more units in each one of your spots here to balance. But again, you don't want to overtree your forehead or the front talus because you'll get eyebrow drop, and that's almost worse than eyelid drop. And again, more variations in, in the front, though. The hardest people to treat are men that have these deep lines. Why is that? Because the lower third of the front talus, which is where this deep line is, is what controls the movement of the brow. So if you put anything in here or too much here, the brow is going to freeze or it's going to drop. So men, I usually do their glabellar and their crow's feet. If they have this kind of pattern, have them come back in two weeks because when you do the corrugator here and here, you know that through diffusion it's going to cover one centimeter all the way around. So it may soften this or knock this lower line out quite well, and then all you'd have to do is put a little bit on the top to control it. Obviously somebody like this needs more, somebody like this needs less, and it's just a matter of less is better because you can always add more. In the old days we used to put 20, 40 units, all these points. Now what we need to do is subtreat the patients because we want their brows to go up. Less application points, less total dose, it keeps more natural. And the way I do it is I take the middle canthus and put two units. Those of you who work with me, you'll see most of my patients get eight units, ten maximum on the forehead. So two, usually it's one or one and a half in the lateral, middle, I'm sorry, the medial canthus and then the lateral limbus, which is the outside edge of the iris. Occasionally, if someone has a lot of strong muscles over here, I'll put in one unit over here. So it would be two, four, and five, and five on the other side, ten units. Otherwise, very rare that I put more than that. One of the things that you have to watch is what I'm telling you about here. And this lady, I have her resting in a normal position. She's about 70. And I have her to open her eyelids. See what happens. Now open your eyes. Stay relaxed. Close your eyes again. Open your eyes again. So does everybody notice what's happening here? When she's opening her eyes, her eyebrows go up. 
in her mind, her brain is telling her, in order to get these eyes lids to go up, I need to activate my frontalis muscle, pull the brows up, that it helps me pull the lids up. So in an older person, you should always do that test sitting upright and ask them to do that. If they lift their eyebrows up, if you put anything in their forehead here, for sure, they're going to come down with brow ptosis and heaviness. And they'll say, I was trying to put on my mascara or my eyeshadow, and my eyelids were so heavy I couldn't do it. So these patients, I do the, the glabella area and the crow's feet, and then have them come back in two weeks. And then I evaluate them, and I see if I need to put a little bit. Again, you're injecting four units here, three units here. It's going to diffuse up. It may soften the forehead enough that you don't need it. As compared to a younger person, and this is an extreme, obviously, but look at what happens with this lady when she opens up her eyes. Close your eyes. Open them. Close your eyes. Open them. See, her brows don't move at all. So she would be very easy to do the forehead. I'm not going to show this video, but basically it's the middle canthus and the lateral limbus. Again, before and afters. And, you know, these are older pictures where we really were freezing people. I don't like to freeze people like a statue. I think it's a waste. On the lower area, you have to be very careful. On the upper area, the muscle groups are very independent. You have the obicularis muscle, you have the, the procerus muscle, the corrugator, and the frontalis. On the lower part of the face, you have all these muscles that are inserting in and around the mouth. So you have to be very careful. And that's why lower dilution or more concentration is better because the muscles that we want to attack here are this rhizorus, if you have a big smile, the levator superior, if they have a gummy smile, the orbicularis, oris, a little bit on the lip, the depressor angularis over here. You want to avoid these, uh, the uh, depressors of the lip, and then you can't really see it, but down here, the mentalis muscle. These are the muscles that you would inject, as well as the, the neck muscles. But higher concentration, lower amounts of units are going to be much safer to use. For the gummy smile, you want to inject right here. If you feel while we're talking in the crease of your nose here, there's like a little bone drop off. That's exactly where you want to put it because the levator superioris of the lip comes right through here. So by putting two to five units there, I usually start with 2.5, you can drop that lip. In an older person, you may get too long of a lip. So it has to be usually younger people will do better. And you can see here the difference before and after. And that's what you want to try to achieve by putting your points here, but in an older person, this lip may drop too low and it doesn't look right, so you have to be careful. If you want to do these lipstick lines, or what they call in Spanish the, the barcode lines, you can put small amounts of units, a half a unit, a half a unit symmetrically around. Always do less. And what that does is it relaxes these lines, but at the same time, you also get a little bit of eversion because the way the muscle contracts, it pulls the lip up, so it almost looks like she had filler here when she really didn't. And then this area here, the apple, -y, apple dumpling or the popple chin, <clears throat> by injecting the mentalis, about 2.5 units in each side, you can get a nice smoothing of the chin. So this is usually maximum of one unit per site, usually a half a unit. With those 0.3 cc syringes, you can actually control a half unit, whereas with the 1 cc syringe, you would never be able to do that. So this is just a video showing the injections here. You're doing it symmetrically. Sorry, it's a little bit out of focus, but this is an older video, but it's kind of nice because it shows. You want to try to be symmetrical. The depressor angularis muscle is a great muscle to inject. It's very hard to get the patients to do that. If you can get them to, if you can get them to create that movement here, and those of you, when you're with me, ask me to show you, you can feel the muscle. When you can feel the muscle real clearly, it's an easy injection. If you can't feel the muscle, you follow the nasolabial fold all the way down until it gets right to the jawline, and that's where you want to inject. You don't want to go too medial, because if you get the depressor of the lip, you're going to get up asymmetry, and the patient's going to be very unhappy. So when you take the depressor, you see how it, you can feel it there very well. When you take that away, the lip kind of goes up, because this muscle here pulls up, and there's no, there's no antagonistic muscle pulling this way, so you corn, the corners of the lip kind of go up. So it's a nice little injection, but certainly more for advanced. Here we're dealing with the platysmal muscle, and a lot of people don't like the bands, but also the platysmal muscle starts from the insertion on the cheek and goes all the way down into the chest. So anything you can do to relax that downward pull of the neck and lower chin 
is going to allow the upper chin to go up. So you want to mark, you don't have to mark, but I'm showing for the purposes, the depressor angularis oris, the mentalis muscle, and again, you can see the depressor angularis, if you can't get it by visualizing, you can just follow the nasal labial fold, and that's where you want to go, okay? So this would be 2.5 units in each one of these spots. You want to feel underneath, and this is what they call a Nefertiti lift, and you want to put units there, one or two units in each of those spots, and then you want to kind of follow your platysmal bands down. The skin on the platysmal is very much like the eyelid skin or the crow's feet skin. It's very, very thin and the muscle is very close. You never want to touch the muscle when you're, you, I always inject subcutaneously in the eyelid region because if you touch muscle during surgery, what happens? It's very vascular, it bleeds. So we, we know it diffuses one centimeter by going subcutaneous on top of the muscle, it will diffuse enough into the muscle and you avoid getting black and blue. Well, obviously, like cutting a nevus out and creating a divot, most people don't want to come for cosmetic things and get a black and blue mark. So the platysmal, basically the skin is attached to the muscle and you want to just pinch up the skin and be very, very superficial. You want to just create wheels. You want to do injection sites about one centimeter apart or one and a half centimeters apart and each one of these points is maybe one cc. I mean one unit. You want to avoid this area here because you don't want to create dysphagia or dys dysphonia. And you know some people used to say that you know when you're doing sit-ups you lose the strength in your neck. So if you want to just tell people that they may feel a little bit of change in the way their muscles are, but obviously what we're doing is we're relaxing those muscles. <clears throat> so those are the points of um, injection. You want to fill up. I usually use one syringe per each anatomical area that I'm doing. I throw them away. People that do, people that do, uh, people that do a lot of, uh, you know, draw up like one cc and just use the same needle. After the third or fourth pinch, the sharpness of the needle goes away and it gets dull. I just want to show you. Hopefully, let me see if I can advance it. How uh, when you're trying to do the platysma, you want to pinch the skin or go very superficial. You see, I'm la I'm parallel to the skin. I don't go in perpendicular, and I'm trying to create little wheels, little welts at the surface. If you go deeper, you're going to get a black and blue mark. So be very careful, and you'll be successful. Now, don't overpromise the neck. It can be better, but it's not going to be like a surgery. Okay, so you don't want to overpromise it. You want to pick the right candidate, someone who's got a lot of subplatysmal fat or, or submental fat or has so much redundancy, they're not going to be able to get that lift. But someone that's got a thin neck, certainly will get a nice result. So you want to follow your points, kind of follow the muscles down, and usually it's a quite nice. These are some before and after pictures. You can see the banding has gone away. There's a better definition of the jawline. All this excess skin that used to be here, you don't really see it anymore. Now a combination of that with Kybella, and you get some nice results before and after. I don't know what this is. This was a One thing I like to do when I'm doing uh, my filler injections, we're going to go to filler now, is I create a little ball of product at the tip of the needle. I do 99% of my injections are anti-grade and retrograde. Why do I do that? So if I'm putting a pressure and I'm forcing the product through the tip of the needle, that sharp tip of the needle, instead of going into the vessel and creating a black and blue mark, that ball of product is in front of my needle and pushes the vessels out of the way. Now it may be something in my mind, but I really believe that since I started doing that, I have a lot less black and blue marks. So conceptually, you can see here that the needle is going in, it's going to come out, and as this is penetrating, this this ball of product is going to roll or push the vessel out of the way, and I get a nice result. When doing the lips, I think it's very important that your eyes, the needle, and the lip line should all be lined up in the same plane. You never want to take your eyes off the product or the patient because you don't want you can be injecting and all of a sudden you get a blurb of pride that goes off to the side. You don't want that, so you want to watch. Now, I love to try to catch this plane. It's like a, a plane that no one describes, but between the wet and dry border, that once you get in there, and sometimes you get in right away, sometimes you don't. When you don't, you stop. When you do get into the right plane, you'll see that it tracks. See, on this side, I had a little bit of trouble. But you'll see in maybe one of the other videos that it will track, and when you get that tracking, is the best uh, is the best result. Look here, you don't want to get those blebs, so you want to try to avoid that. Here you can see that it tracked from here all the way to here, and that's when you're going to get the best 
result. I think there's some better ones. This next video may be better. Let's see if we can get the tracking in a little bit better. You can see here when you inject and you get in the right plane, what happens is the product goes all the way over to here. You see it went all the way to here and you get nice, smooth, symmetrical. You don't want to get a little what we call uh, pulsed or step up uh, injections because then you get more like bumpy. You have to be careful. This is a patient that came to see me that had some tear trough injections and they were complaining they felt something in their eye and when I looked down there I saw that this was the Restylane that was coming through the conjunctiva. So you got to be very careful with your anatomical positioning because you don't want that to happen here. It's very simple. You could nick it and squeeze it out or use a little hyaluronidase to dissolve it. You should always have hyaluronidase. This is a little pearl now for some laser pearls with a pulse dye laser and you're trying to do cherry angiomas. Why are you going to treat the surrounding skin? So I take an index card, I punch holes in it with various sizes and I kind of put them over the angioma so I'm only treating the location that's, that's really required. You can see here a lot less surface rather than this 10 millimeter spot is being treated by putting that little hole there. The same thing if you're doing like on the lip line, you want to try to avoid any of the normal skin so you create whatever pattern you need in order to treat the appropriate area. Sclerotherapy, again, I think it's interesting but I don't do a lot of it anymore. I think really you have to do endoscopic but I always put a little bit of air at the beginning of my needle because <clears throat> and I always bend the needle because this, these, these vessels are so superficial and so fragile that if you try to go in on an angle or perpendicularly most of the time you go through it. By putting a little bit of air if the patient's in an angle and you get into the venous system the air gets sucked up as the blood is rushing back to the heart and you get a great like flash. This first one you don't really see it so much but if you pay attention to on the second one the second uh, type of inject, the second injection which let's see where it is right here you should see how it blanches quite nicely maybe maybe it's here you get in that bit of air uh, let's see I guess maybe not Anyways, so it's it's hard to see, and I don't know why. Usually you can see it better. I don't know if you're seeing it better on your side, but by having a little bit of air, if you get into the vessel and you get in, it blows the vessel clear right away. If you're not in the vessel, you get like a little bit of crepitus or a little bit of air in the skin, and you know you're not in the right place, so you stop injecting. You don't want to get the sclerosis into the skin because that can cause pain and uh, a little bit of uh, necrosis. So this is just the last two pearls. This one for... How do you tell the difference between a plantar wart versus a callus? And if you watch, this one obviously has been treated once, but if you take a finger and you push straight up and down on it, watch the gentleman's face. Okay, he doesn't really feel too much pain, but if you squeeze it side to side, it's very, very painful. And I don't know why that's been someone called me that pearl. I think um, Lou Kaplan, who is a clinical dermatologist, and most people don't think about it, but it's very, very helpful. You should try it next time you have a patient. If you push on it perpendicularly and it's painful, it usually recommends a callus or a bone spur. So here you can see there's no expression on the guy's face. If you squeeze it side to side or pinch it, all of a sudden it becomes very, very painful. So that's something to, to determine the difference between a, a plantar verruca and a callus. The last thing is something like this tinea versicolor. You may not know what it is, but if you take the skin and you stretch it, you'll get this flaky scaling right away and that gives it away as a uh, tinea versicolor or pitarizes versicolor. I think that's my last slide everyone. I appreciate uh, your paying attention and if there's any questions I'll be happy to uh, answer them. Thank you very much Dr. Zayek. It was uh, uh, you know fantastic. We, I mean I myself learned a great deal and, and, and enjoyed it. Uh, so now the audience can uh, give some uh, questions and Anne was uh, texting first so let me see so when you did the uh, presentation on the nevus then uh, Anne's question regarding that if the nevus is going to repigment after uh, you know shaving it off because some part will be uh, staying inside the patient 
<clears throat> right, that's a good question. And when I when I explain to the patient what we're going to do, I tell them that the nevus obviously has a, a part that's exophytic or or above the skin and a part that's below the roots. The only way to get the entire nevus out, as you know, would be to cut it out and put stitches. That's going to definitely leave a scar. So I tell them that by shaving it flat, if it's a very, very pigmented nevus, the pigment may still be there. But instead of being erased, which is what usually bothers more people than the pigment, it'll be flat and pigmented. Sometimes you shave them off when they're pigmented and it's nice and pink and normal looking skin, but obviously it has, you know, a dermal component and when it starts to migrate up, it may get pigmented again. And it may grow back a little bit again, but it never grows back as big as it was. It would be just a small little bit like of a dome shape, which if it bothers them can be shaved off again or just left there. Most of the time they pretty much do quite well. But the pigment can definitely come back and you should tell your patient that that's definitely a possibility. And does it matter if it is uh, you, what kind of lesion you are starting with? Like the one that you showed, it was like a, a pretty typical intradermal nevus, not really pigmented. Are those more prone to uh, get repigmented? Or uh, like, let's say if you, you have like a dysplastic nevus and then you would uh, shave that, would that be more common to get pigment on top of those? I think if it's, uh, you know... It's hard to tell. I mean, if it's if I'm suspicious that it's a dysplastic nevus, I wouldn't do that kind of a shave biopsy. I would do like a bi you know a biopsy to remove it. But if I think it's just a dermal nevus, if it's like compound or combination, then there's probably better chances that it's going to be repigmented. But the patients are usually happy. What bothers them mostly is that it's it's protruding and raised. You know. I see. I especially enjoyed you know the videos on the cyst removal because it makes a lot of sense. Uh, on histology, we see that uh, the, the capsule, that uh, thin layer of epidermis that uh, is uh, lining the cyst is actually, when it is uh, pushed and squeezed, it is rupturing and leading to uh, uh, granulomatous reaction. So that's the keratin itself that is going to make uh, the cyst inflamed. So it makes so much sense to be able to carve that out. And, and it is like an endoscopical surgery. Uh, for cysts, so I, I really like that. It was... Right, and, and the easiest ones are the pilar cysts, because I think the capsule is much thicker. And most of the time, people aren't squeezing the, the pilar cysts, you know, the ones on the scalp. The ones on the back and arms, when people can get to it and start squeezing it, sometimes the repetitive squeezing that maybe ruptures a little bit on the inside creates inflammation and then fibrosis, and the capsule is harder to get out. But I would say that at least seven out of ten times, I can get the capsule out nicely through a small little hole, and it, sometimes I don't even put a stitch in. You know, it's it's much easier and nicer for the patient, and they appreciate it. You know, yes, I'm not billing for a three centimeter excision, but I'm doing what's right for the patient, in my opinion. And the end result is amazing, I think, because uh, you you leave the tissue totally intact, and uh, yeah. that's fantastic. Okay, so with that, uh, thank you again. Uh, we greatly enjoyed and a lot of uh, of the audience thanking you uh, for the lecture uh, we had a great time we learned a lot and we would really like to learn a lot more from you so hope you hopefully uh, you will come back next year and and give us a, a couple of talks during uh, january february march when you have time and uh, hope you will enjoy art basil and with that thank you so much again and all right thank luck. you guys as well thank you very much and i'll be more than happy to do a couple lectures in the next, you know, bunch of months for sure. Uh, great. Thank you again. Okay. Have a good night, everyone. Bye-bye. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.